Hello ladies and gentlemen of YouTube and welcome back to another edition of videos. Today I wanted to show you a beautiful game that was played in the 8th Chess Olympiad as part of my chess blog that I've got on chess.com. So this was a beautiful game played by Daniel Yanofsky and at the time he was just 14 years old playing in his first Olympiad on board two. Quite an incredible achievement for a 14 year old I must say. Later in his life you might know, if, if you're from Canada, that he was the first Canadian chess grandmaster and over the years he would play in a further 10 chess Olympiads. Quite a strong player and certainly at 14 years old, you know, playing an Olympiad, he, he actually went on to do some great things in chess. Uh, he would also uh, play in two interzonals and probably in his prime he was maybe in the top 20 chess players in the world at, at some point. So um, this this particular game caught the attention of, at the time, world champion Alexander Alakine. And in fact, Alexander Alakine would write six pages, six whole pages of analysis for Daniel. I, I imagine, could you imagine being at 14 years old, having the best chess player in the world give you six pages of his own analysis about your game? Quite, quite a cool thing, I would say. It'd be amazing if, uh, if Carlson did something like that for, uh, you know, some of the young up and coming players, gave him six pages worth of analysis. Amazing. Okay, so let's have a look at this game. So Daniel was playing in this game uh, a player I've never heard of before, Alberto Delanto. I believe he represented Chile, and this was played in the first kind of first section of the uh, Chess Olympiad. So there was two round robin competitions. Uh, this was the first round robin um, where Daniel was playing on the board too. So the game started: e4, e6, d4, d5. Knight to c3, knight to f6, bishop to g5, and d takes an e4. So I believe this is called the burn variation. Um, the uh, you know black, black uh, white gets I guess nice activity and a little bit of space against this variation, but black's black's defense is relatively compact. He doesn't tend to have too many weaknesses to worry about. So knight takes on e4, then have uh, knight b to d7. Knight to f3, bishop e7, and then there's a capture. Bishop to d3, c5, d takes c5, queen a4. So giving a check and then just recapturing this pawn now. c3, queen takes on c5, castles and castles. So, so far so good for both players. Relatively normal stuff for now. Um, the only thing I would sort of say about this position is whilst black has not really got a huge amount of weaknesses in his position in terms of his pawn structure, he does still need to worry about what to do about this bishop on uh, c8. How, he how he's able to deploy it effectively will determine um, the, his success in this game. One thing, one cool feature about this position uh, for white is white has got this potential um, I guess triumvirates of chess pieces which is a very deadly attacking formation that you often see in a lot of Greek uh, Greek sacrifices so keep keep your eye on this in these three pieces as you'll see white is able to uh, to deliver a really good kingside attack so let's see how that occurred though so rook to e1 was first played so actually preparing this knight to come to e5 rook to d8, knight to e5. So this lovely knight is now perched on e5 and it prevents the deployments of this bishop on c8. I think the bishop, if it came here, the knight would be happy to exchange it off and give white the bishop pair. So here black uh, tries to solve the problem of his bishop and in doing so he plays the move b6. Probably not the best move here as now Black totally missed a beautiful tactical combination from the 14-year-old. A better move here would have been probably h6, the key defensive move, as it now um, pushes the bishop away but also allows uh, black to defend uh, this position a bit better. Um, so the point being bishop to h4, rook to d5 to then try and evict this knight from, uh, from e5. So if, let's say, uh, bishop to g3, now 
Black can think about trying to get his bishop out by either uh, b6. He can actually still play bishop to d7. I mean, I guess it's not the end of the world if there's a recapture here, as now the knight can come back, um, which it couldn't do in uh, the previous positions due to uh, this this bishop being here. But also, I think actually the rook recapture is not too bad, as you then got uh, two rooks on this open file, potentially. So, going back then. What happened in this position? So what would you play if you were white here and you wanted to uh, try and blow black off the board? So the key move here is in fact bishop takes on f6 and uh, well essentially white is going to win a pawn here and have a devastating attack. So after bishop takes on f6 Bishop takes on h7, a lovely move. The point being here is that black cannot afford to capture with his king here, as this will just be disaster for him. As now, queen to h5 check, king to g8, queen takes on f7, king to h7, and then the key move to threaten the checkmate, rook to e3. The point being is that Black's only move to save the position is in fact sacrificing his queen here as this move is now threatening checkmate in one. So going back to our position. So instead, instead of capturing, uh, Black decided to play king to f8. The queen still came to h5, so just continuing to threaten uh, checkmate here. Um, in the game, bishop captured here on e5. I'm just kind of interested to see what would happen after uh, g6 here. In fact, this is totally losing to another beautiful sacrifice here. The point being, if um, the pawn recaptures uh, like so, then uh, queen with check. If the bishop came back to g7, you can really start laying in some pain to black's position. In fact, oh, this is dreadful for him. And then we've got the same problems. Well, the knight can come into g6, actually. And actually, we've still got the same issues of this rook rerouting around. So not, not something I would recommend. Never move any pawns in front of your king to expose him to more checks. So in the actual game, bishop captured here on e5. Rook recaptured, now threatening the queen. But the queen came back to c7, now defending f7 here now. So um, bishop came back to e4, a move of a lot of energy as it now opens up this queen to come and deliver a check but also attacks the rook here and now after the bishop came here there's a capture, the queen came to h8, king to e7, queen captured on g7 uh, to now regain two pawns but it looks as though black is going to be a uh, winning here. What do you think? So the key, a really testing move that black played here was rook to g8 and it looks as though black is winning now. What do you think? The point being if this queen moved to let's say here there'll be a simple checkmate in one on g2. So has the Canadian 14 year old made a key blunder here? Well can you see the great move that white played to then win the game? So the brilliant move that white played and the move that Alexander Alakine would give his own seal of approval, giving it one exclamation mark. I didn't give it two, but he gave it one exclamation mark, which is probably enough. I think it deserves two exclamation marks. Is rook takes here on e6, a stunning move. The point being now, if the king captures, which it does do, Rook to e1. White has enough initiative to now keep delivering checks and win the game. So king came to d6, queen to f6 check. Now if this king goes back to any of these squares, um, the there's too many problems for white. White has enough checks to either win the queen or checkmate the black king. So the king came to c5 to get away from his own queen. But now, rook to e5 was played, king came to c4, the only move. He could block with the queen, but um, that's probably probably not the best, best move to do here as, uh, well, just a simple d6 
deflection tactic here now. King comes to c4, uh, queen to f4, just pushing the queen, king away from the queen, and then recapturing. So definitely doesn't want to do that. So the king came to c4, b3 check, king came to d3, queen to d6 check again, king came to c2, rook to e2, and in fact, black resigned here. The point is, there's an inevitable checkmate in two here. So if, let's say, the king came to b1, simple checkmate in uh, one there. If it came to c1, instead, again, queen to d2, king comes across, and then checkmate. The cutest variation is after king comes, check takes on c2. In fact, this is checkmate in one with queen to d2 and you'll notice here that the queen is covering all of these squares and the final pit square is covered by this pawn. What a beautiful mate. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, game as much as I did. Um, do check out my chess blog where I've uh, had a look at the 8th chess olympiad and some of the best games from that and a little bit of history about the 8th uh, chess olympiad. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll speak to you later. Take care, bye.